Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for being here for our second talk of this uh, workshop of innovation biomedical engineering of our uh, Programa de Pós-Graduação em Engenharia Biomédica uh, da Universidade Federal de São Paulo. Uh, vou falar em inglês porque temos um hóspede internacional. Então, I'm going to speak in English because of our foreign speaker, who is a Dr. Omeri Nan, uh, whom I've been knowing for some time, uh, used to attend meetings that he attends every year, uh, scientific meetings. And, um, and uh, I don't know what happened, I'm sorry about that. Um, so uh, Dr. Inan is a faculty with uh, Georgia Tech, the department of uh, the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Georgia Tech. And he's a graduate of Stanford University where he did is a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science, and a PhD. Uh, a very interesting thing that he can bring to, to our meeting is that he's got experience also uh, as um, uh, in the industry. Uh, after finishing his PhD, he moved to the industry and then he moved back to the academia uh, uh, when he uh, got his position at Georgia Tech. Um, he deals, his research deals mostly with the medical devices and systems and uh, his focus is to translate his research from the lab to patient care. So this is perfect for our biomedical engineering audience, especially for our bachelor and master students. And Omer, I would like to thank you, thank you immensely for accepting my invitation again, and we're eager to see your talk. Thanks so much, thank you. No, it's really my pleasure to give this talk, and I'm excited to hear the questions that people have at the end and be able to interact with you. So. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Let me just share my screen now and let's, uh, hopefully this should work. We tried it a second ago, so guessing there's not gonna be any issues. Okay. And so with that, I'll go ahead and start my talk. So uh, as, as uh, Dr. Aletti mentioned, you know, I have some involvement with industry uh, and both, both sort of as in a consulting capacity, but also uh, I'm the co-founder of a couple of different companies. One of them is called CardioSense, which is trying to commercialize some of the work that our lab is doing in the area of cardiovascular sensing and uh, developing platform technologies to try to address different cardiovascular uh, monitoring needs. One is focused on joint health monitoring that's called Arthroba. And so both of these, of course, are relevant to the information I'll talk about today. Uh, in my talk. So my, uh, my research group is focused on many different problems, uh, but one of our core areas of strength and interest is really in leveraging the sounds and vibrations of the body as an indicator of health status. And it's kind of interesting, but uh, you know, maybe you think about it, maybe you don't, but as you're just sort of sitting there, your body is constantly making sounds and vibrations. You know, your heart is beating. This leads to vibrations of the body. This leads to sounds. Your lungs are making sounds. You have bowel sounds. Your joints are making sounds. And there's basically, there's sounds and vibrations emanating continuously from the body. And so our group is very interested in developing wearable technology and algorithms to be able to use these sorts of sounds and vibrations to help clinicians, caregivers, and also patients have a better quality of life and care. So today's talk, I'm going to organize into really two areas of focus. The first will be focused on heart sounds and vibrations and how we use those for a variety of clinical applications. And the second area is going to be focused on knee sounds and associated measures and how we use those for arthritis and other sorts of musculoskeletal diseases and disorders. So your heart, of course, is a pump that is sitting within your chest. And every time it beats, it's pushing blood through the aorta and the pulmonary artery to the areas that it needs to go within the body. The heart is- Mayor, Excuse me, can I- So the, the heart is a mechanical pump. Uh, at the same time, it's driven by electrical signals. And then the excitation contraction coupling is what leads to, of course, the actual ejection of blood. And as the heart is beating within the chest, of course, one of the things you may or may not think about is that actually these forces that the heart is putting on blood to be able to move it around uh, lead to sort of recoil forces that the body experiences 
And these can actually be sensed by transducers on the surface of the skin as vibrations of the body in response to the heartbeat. Uh, but you know, the, the types of measurements maybe you think about more frequently, of course, for the heart are not with this kind of apparatus, but are usually uh, aspects of electrophysiology instead. So even more than 100 years ago, this is Eindhoven, was taking measurements of what's now called the electrocardiogram using these very old instruments, you know, that were actually state of the art at the time where he had his hands and feet in buckets of water. Those were his electrodes. And those then connected to this instrument called a string galvanometer where he would actually be able to observe the ECG signal. So people usually attribute this as kind of the first sort of cardiovascular measurement in a lot of ways, but actually you would have to go back another 100 years to see the first stethoscope that was invented. And there's other sorts of designs that maybe even came before this, but a lot of times Linek is considered to be the inventor of the stethoscope. And what people used to do at that time is they would put their ears up against the chest of the patient and try to listen to hear for various different murmurs and issues. And Linek was actually using a stethoscope, which was an instrument he built to be able to better hear the sounds from the body. So kind of interesting, but actually the, the acoustic and mechanical measurements of the heart actually predated the electrical measurements that could be taken. So all this kind of fast forward many, many years to a device that actually a very close collaborator of mine named Mazi Adamati and I developed that was this chest patch that could not only measure electrical, but also the mechanical aspects of cardiovascular function. And so, and there were other sort of wearable devices to measure these things that were built. Actually, some of the earliest uh, systems for wearable uh, measurement of the mechanical aspects of heart function were built for astronauts in space uh, in the 60s and 70s. And there's, there are different instantiations of that. But this was, to the best of our knowledge, the first patch that could just sit on the chest with ECG electrodes and measure both the electrical and mechanical aspects of heart function. And you can see on the right, in this case, the mechanical signals associated with the heartbeat for normal heartbeats on top and premature ventricular contractions on the bottom. Just for illustrative purposes at this point, we're going to get into much more detail on these measurements in a second. So my colleague, Mazi Adamati, and I and our team from 2015 to 2023 worked hard on trying to improve the usability and also the signal quality of the patch and advance the number of modalities that could be measured. And so we went from this thing that was on the chest that was kind of the size of your iPhone at first, and then moved to uh, what we used to call the hockey puck, which is kind of this uh, cylindrical sort of shape that's shown in the middle picture here. And then finally, we landed on what we use now, which is this uh, sternal, sternal uh, device that we're now commercializing through CardioSense. Uh, on the academic side, we've been calling the Seisma patch. At CardioSense, they're calling this CardioTag, the commercial version. And this sort of just, again, all of these adhere to the chest using ECG electrodes and measure the mechanical aspects of heart function as well. With the Seismo patch hardware, we're also measuring uh, optical measures, basically the photoplethysmogram signal with um, six different uh, measurements of that because two of them are green wavelength, the other ones are red and IR and at two different locations. And so uh, this is basically a multimodal sensing patch that captures the electrical, mechanical, and optical signals from the chest wall and allows us to really use these signals for a number of different clinical applications. And over the past 10 years, we've done a lot of work on using the signals measured by this patch and the previous versions, including the hockey puck, in various different clinical studies where we tried to aim for estimating uh, filling pressures in patients with heart failure, decompensation status, you know, VO2 max, stroke volume, and a number of different studies with a uh, combination of patients with heart failure, perioperative patients, and healthy volunteers as well. And with this, actually, we've had to develop a pipeline for dealing with these sorts of signals. So the kind of signals that are measured um, in the mechanical domain actually suffer a lot more from motion artifacts, respiratory artifacts, and other sorts of things, even speech, for example, can make these signals become noisy. 
And so there's a lot of work that our lab has had to do to automate the process of filtering and assessing signal quality for these sorts of measurements and ultimately deriving physiologically and clinically relevant information from them. Uh, and so this pipeline was really uh, spearheaded by a student named Asim Ghazi in my lab, who's now doing his postdoc at Harvard. So I wanna just say a few things about one application area that's really been the driving force behind what we've been doing here. And this has been the motivation, honestly, all along for us to build this technology has been the problem of monitoring patients with heart failure outside of clinical settings. So heart failure is a, I mean, really a terminal sort of condition with very high mortality rate. I think it's 50% mortality in the first three years or something like that. It's very, of course, you know, major issue where your heart is unable to deliver the blood, oxygen, and nutrients required to the body. And so when patients have heart failure, they're really in the state where their body is just trying everything it can to be able to compensate for the fact that the pump is weakened. And uh, within this process, there's basically, you can think of an engineering control loop where you know the set point is never met and where different parts of the control loop are really failing slowly in time. And I'm, it's unfortunate to think of it that way, but it's really the case. So a lot of times what happens is patients with heart failure are coming in and out of the hospital continuously. And they may spend two months at home. They may spend two weeks in the hospital. They may send another three, four months at home. They may send another two to three weeks in the hospital. And it's a difficult process. And what's been shown now with implantable devices, so what's shown here on the left side of the screen is a device called CardioMEMS. This is actually a pressure sensor that's implanted in the pulmonary artery of the patient and measures every time the patient puts basically the receiver, which is like a pillow against their chest, this device transmits the, uh, passively provides actually the pressure values from the pulmonary artery. And since these devices have been implanted in patients with heart failure, there's been an ability that was unprecedented before where one could observe the different changes in physiology and hemodynamics that led to ultimately a hospitalization and clinical congestion. So all the way out to 20 to 30 days before a patient has a hospitalization, you actually start seeing filling pressures, specifically pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillary wedge pressures increasing over the normal value. From that point, there's a series of other events. And in the last few days, you see symptom changes and weight change, and that's when you get the decompensation that occurs. Unfortunately, there's a major divide between what we need to know at home, which is filling pressures, and what non-invasive devices currently can provide which is basically symptoms and weight. And so our group has really been working hard to try to bridge that divide. So our philosophy is that if you have a wearable sensor that can measure the right combination of factors, and specifically that's uh, measurements that relate to hemodynamics and hopefully filling pressures, that that wearable sensor signals could then be transferred um, to, let's say, a uh, visualization framework that could be used by the clinician and caregiver to titrate care, to increase certain diuretic dosages or other sorts of drugs that can keep heart failure patients home for longer and keep them out of this sort of loop of always going back to the hospital, coming out, always going back to the hospital. So this is kind of the motivation for the work, and I'll just jump into some of our studies now to give you a flavor for the kind of things we've been finding. So one of the first studies we performed was actually in patients with heart failure in two different groups. One is a group that's compensated, meaning that the heart is weakened, but the body is finding a way to get around that through this sort of compensation scheme or control loop, you might say. Uh, and the second group is decompensated, where as hard as their body is trying to compensate for the lack of uh, strength in the heart, they really can't get away with it and they're sort of acutely hospitalized at that point. And what you're looking at basically on the top and bottom are uh, K-nearest neighbor plots showing each of these dots represents one uh, window in the uh, signal and the corresponding actually FFT in this case. So basically what you're looking at is kind of a time point by time point uh, graph that visualizes the frequency structure of the SCG signal. 
And on the left side for both of these patients, you see what the graph looks like when they're at rest. On the right side, you see what the graph looks like after they've performed the six minute walk test or six minutes of exercise. And what you'll notice is for the compensated patient, because of the fact that their heart is not completely, you know, their body is able to compensate for the weakened heart, they're actually able to change their physiological state in response to the exercise. And that you can tell because of the structural changes in the SCG signal that occur, the seismocardiogram signal. In the decompensated patient, you don't see many changes at all. And what we did was we actually quantified this by something called graph similarity score. And we compared the compensated to decompensated patients and found that there was a significant difference between the two groups in their graph similarity score. The decompensated patients data was more similar when you compared before and after exercise. They were not able to change their state in response to the exercise. Using that same metric, we looked at these patients who were decompensated from the day that they were admitted to the hospital until the day that they were discharged from the hospital. And the idea was we wanted to track the same patients over time to see if as their state improved, would we see changes in the signal that also reflected a state improvement. And in fact, we did in all of the patients uh, from admit to discharge. In one of the patients then we had a readmission because of the fact that they had uh, volume overload, which is usually what heart failure patients are admitted with. And what we found was actually there was a uh, backward step in their graph similarity score where it got worse at that point compared to before they were discharged. And also uh, for one patient, there was a heart transplant and there was a gigantic change in GSS as well. So all of this provided us kind of the backdrop uh, for thinking that perhaps these signals that we're measuring may have some value in assessing hemodynamic status in patients with heart failure. But really the information we needed very badly for that was a direct comparison to exactly the, the values that are used currently with this CardioMEMS implantable sensor that I had mentioned. And so, we performed a study where we had our hockey puck version of our patch worn at the same time as pulmonary artery and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure measurements were being taken with a catheter. All of these measurements were synchronized in time using some software that we developed. And we also had the ECG signal on the patch as well. So on the right side, you see the ECG, you see three axes of seismocardiogram vibrations from the chest and you see the pulmonary artery pressure measured with the catheter on the bottom. This was the first time that such an experiment was done. And what we did was we wanted to detect if pulmonary artery pressure changed using a pharmacological challenge, would that elicit a change in the signals that we measure? And what we found was, yes, it did. So when we gave a vasodilator to these patients and vasodilator reduces pulmonary artery pressure because of an increase in uh, vasodilation and, and because of that uh, reduction in afterload. What we found was as the vasodilator reduced pulmonary artery pressure, we saw two main changes in the seismocardiogram signal. One was we found that the main peak of the signal in systole moved further out, so reflected basically a longer pre-ejection period. The second thing that we found was the uh, second main complex of the signal also moved further out and was a little more pronounced. And that indicated that there was a longer left ventricular ejection time. And the third thing that we found that was really important was in the diastolic portion of the signal, which many people had not previously analyzed, we found some big differences in the SCG in both the dorsoventral axis and also the side to side lateral axis. And so these were important for us to key in on. And so with our algorithm, again, with this pipeline that I talked about, we did R peak detection, outlier removal and all this. And we did some feature extraction and trained a model that could form a regression relationship between changes in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure measured with our device compared to the gold standard uh, catheter. And we found actually there was very good correspondence there, both in terms of the agreement and also the correlation in both the training set and also the held out test set. So this is exciting. 
And so this is kind of that particular plot is sort of the basis for what we're trying to do with CardioSense, where we're trying to commercialize this technology. Uh, we're doing a clinical study now where we're going to recruit 500 people and create basically a very generalizable model that relates the parameters measured by our device to those measured by normally a catheter or an implantable device. Uh, but I'll kind of take a step back here now and say that, you know, heart failure is not the only problem. On the academic side, I started becoming interested in not only the problem case where you have volume overload, which is really where your preload is too high for the heart to handle, but also the case of hypovolemia, where now in this case, what you do is you take somebody you know who's healthy, let's say, and perhaps they've had some form of trauma. Maybe they had a gunshot wound or, uh, or were stabbed. And, or they've had a car accident, they're losing a lot of blood. And as they're losing blood, what happens is actually their heart is now being starved of enough filling uh, to be able to sort of perform adequately. And so on one hand, we had hypervolemia or volume overload. Now we're thinking about the case of hypovolemia. And if you have the same kind of signals that were sensitive to filling status in the case of hypervolemia, why should these signals not be sensitive also to the uh, other case where you're having suboptimal filling, not enough filling of the heart? And there's really a lot of different physiological scenarios where hypovolemia becomes uh, valid and, and interesting to study. The one that I mentioned, of course, of hemorrhage, where somebody's actually bleeding, is a great example. In that case, the body doesn't have enough blood volume circulating to be able to meet the demands. But you can also think of other cases where now maybe the blood volume is normal, but the capacity that has to be filled, the capacitance is bigger. So imagine, for example, if you have somebody with uh, heat stress where they're having to fill the skin with more blood, now you have basically this extra capacitance you're trying to fill, or hypoxia and cold stress are great examples of this as well. And so this is kind of, um, Kind of the problem where you can have hypovolemia both in an absolute and relative case. But so what we're really interested in driving here is if you have a ability to sense somebody's volume status automatically with a wearable device, then decisions like trauma care, triage, and treatment can actually be made by real-time markers of the person's status rather than vital signs, which are actually very late in predicting what's happening. And so the work that we did here, we noticed that actually in this case, there's very little information on the literature in terms of how these signals respond to hypovolemia. And so we had to perform in this case, an animal study where we actually created both absolute and relative hypovolemia. And we had all kinds of invasive measurements as well, giving us gold standards for all the things we wanted to learn. And then compared basically our non-invasive approach to the invasive measures to see how well we could do in assessing volume status. And what you see on the left here is actually what we found, which was exciting. We found that uh, there was a good ability to predict volume status for the pigs for both the absolute and relative hypovolemia cases. In the middle, you see a classifier that's designed to detect decompensation. So in this case, previously for heart failure, we talked about decompensation because there's too much fluid volume for the heart to handle. In this case, this is decompensation because there's not enough blood volume uh, for the heart to be able to perform its function. And so here we were able to classify the case of decompensation with a high AUC. But from a scientific standpoint, what was most interesting to us was looking at the features of these signals that provided the greatest importance in assessing volume status. And specifically what we found was the ratio of pre-ejection period to left ventricular ejection time which is a timing measurement that requires both the electrocardiogram and seismocardiogram, was the one that had the most value in assessing volume status. And so we wanted to look back at the existing literature to see why is this the case that this feature, this timing feature of systole, which kind of tells you about how much of systole is spent building up the pressure to open the aortic valve versus how much of it is spent actually ejecting blood out uh, during systolic ejection. And what we found was actually there's literature dating back to the 70s that the ratio of PEP to LVT 
is a good marker for ventricular performance. Actually, it has an inverse relationship to ejection fraction in some patients. Now, this is something that in different scenarios, it may not hold if you have different changes in preload, afterload, this may not hold. But in general, a reduction in PEP over LVT actually indicates an improvement in ventricular performance. And so it was quite interesting to us to see that this feature that in the literature measured with ultrasound and other sorts of more uh, extensive, cumbersome, expensive equipments actually could be measured with our device now and could indicate uh, ventricular performance changes in the case of hypovolemia. But also, if you think about the feature of PEP itself, you know, this is something that has been studied also in the existing literature as not only a marker of ventricular performance, but actually more so a marker of cardiac sympathetic tone. And so, uh, actually, this is some studies done by Rhodes et al. from 1993, where they had measurements of pre-ejection period with, uh, with non-invasive systems, while at the same time they were measuring uh, with a catheter the left ventricular pressure as a function of time. And of course, the gold standard for cardiac sympathetic tone or cardiac contractility, if you can measure it, is the maximum derivative of left ventricular pressure with respect to time, or DPDT max. And of course, that requires invasive measurements of left ventricular pressure versus time. But using this study, actually, what they found was the pre-ejection period as measured uh, externally had a uh, inverse correlation against this, this catheterization peak contractility, meaning that PEP can be a surrogate measure of cardiac contractility. And there's been many studies since then where they've done this. For us, this started uh, you know, sparking questions about if we can measure uh, with PEP an acute measure of cardiac sympathetic tone, can we use this actually as a marker of stress reactivity and maybe a marker of autonomic state? And there's a lot of literature, again, on using PEP for this, so it's not new necessarily. But in our group, we were very interested in doing this to understand kind of PEP versus heart rate variability and other measures that are more typically uh, taken during stress. And so specifically, we've been interested in being able to quantify these with our small wearable patch, uh, which can actually be deployed more readily than other devices that can measure PEP to the best of our knowledge. And so we've been doing a lot of work with this group out of Emory, uh, led by Dr. Kayumi and Dr. Vaccarino, as well as Dr. Shaw and Bremner. And this is a group that has already demonstrated that actually the responses in patients who have had prior heart attack to public speaking tasks and the way that their physiology responds to that mental stress can tell you a lot about their risk of downstream cardiac events. And so with, with our group, we've been interested in taking our wearable patch and measuring in these same patients the kind of signals and features that, that we normally extract that are representative of mental stress reactivity and comparing these against the kind of things that uh, require more cumbersome equipment in the clinic to see if we could actually have a marker of stress reactivity that could be used maybe outside of clinical settings to assess risk. The other thing we found, and this is kind of, again, this is in agreement with the, the literature and stress physiology, and especially some work that Karen Quigley's group has done out of Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, what we found is that if you look at the PEP signal a PEP signature, I should say, from seismocardiogram and ECG signals. And if you also look at the uh, vasoconstriction that happens during stress as per the optical signal of PPG, you might be able to differentiate between mental versus emotional stressors. And this is important because a lot of times in the stress quantification literature, you want to understand if someone's experiencing what's called threat or what's called challenge. So challenge might be stress associated with a normal sort of uh, positive challenge that you have to, to overcome. Let's say you're getting ready for uh, a football game, you're getting ready for maybe giving an important speech versus you know, uh, threat may be something more like you've received a really negative email, you know, your paper was rejected, or maybe you know, you're scared about, about uh, um, you know, some sort of physical harm that's going to come your way. So, you know, there's different types of stressors and it would be interesting to be able to differentiate between them in the wearable context. And so 
some of these signatures may allow for that to occur. Um, and we've also been using these signatures as markers for being able to quantify the effects of non-invasive neuromodulation therapies on stress reactivity. So again, this is in collaboration with Dr. Bremner out of Emory. And what we've been working on is we've been working on first quantifying the physiological responses to uh, vagus nerve stimulation in both healthy controls and also patients with post-traumatic stress disorder to see if we can reduce the stress reactivity in these patients. And in just the normal sort of stimulation versus uh, active versus sham stimulation, sham being basically placebo, we already see that in the active case, there's less, uh, there's a reduction in sympathetic tone or fight or flight response. And of course that's exciting. And so with that, we've been wanting to kind of quantify also the way that, uh, that physiological reactivity to stress is blunted in patients with PTSD. So this is again, trauma controls with similar findings in PTSD, where again, pre-ejection period was one of these measures that showed a major difference when we stimulated the vagus as did PPG amplitude and respiration rate. So the influence of respiration was also very interesting to us and the way that these stimuli can affect respiration was interesting. So we wanted to dive into that deeper and in fact, what we found, this is now a different population. This is not PTSD, but this is patients with opioid use disorder during active withdrawal. But what we found was actually during uh, transcutaneous cervical VNS or vagus nerve stimulation, not only did you see a change in respiratory rate, but actually you saw a change in respiratory rate variability. In fact, the variability went down when the person was stimulated compared to the other time periods, which is quite interesting and means that you know, our ability to assess maybe autonomics and stress reactivity needs to go beyond just respiratory rate to being able to capture more deep and quantitative markers of respiration. So in our group, we've been working on different instantiations of wearable hardware that can gather more uh, uh, important information about respiration beyond just respiratory rate. So we've been working on bioimpedance-based measures. For example, this is an example of some work that uh, we had done to put electrodes on the chest in sort of a, uh, a rectangular form factor to be able to measure impedance pneumography and see if we could accurately estimate not only respiratory rate, but also tidal volume, the volume of air that you breathe uh, every time you breathe. And recently, actually, uh, a fantastic student out of my group who's getting close to graduating, uh, Jesus Antonio Sanchez Perez, did some amazing work on combining impedance pneumography with uh, lung sounds measurements and demonstrated that actually by using the phase of breathing extracted from impedance pneumography, you can better characterize lung sounds by looking at the way that they change with the different phases of breath. So inspiration versus expiration. On the right, you can basically just see spectrograms of lung sounds measured with our device during inspiration versus expiration. And this is something that we started in a feasibility study with just healthy subjects, but we're doing a lot of work now in asthma and other sorts of disease states where I think there's gonna be some very interesting findings from this that, uh, that will come out. This is a great example of multimodal sensing and analysis that our group is very excited about uh, combining impedance with sounds. And with that, I'm going to talk a little bit now about more of our work in the knee health space, where actually we're combining impedance and sounds. So uh, the knee actually results in many patient visits annually in the US alone. It's 18 million of these visits. I don't know in Brazil, but probably many, many visits to knee injuries. Probably most of them are due to uh, football, and you know other sorts of other sorts of athletic activities, uh, and and actually these are very common. And so is actually the condition of arthritis, not just knee injuries, but as your cartilage starts to wear down, you know, as you're aging, there's processes that lead to knee pain that are also along those lines. And the typical diagnosis and rehab uh, approach for knee injuries is kind of um, surprisingly subjective. It combines actually some subjective hands-on measures that really highly depend on the skill of the person performing these tests, but also on you know, the, the, how close your injury maps to something standard. 
and then a combination of those with really expensive imaging modalities like MRI, CAT scans, and these sorts of things that take a lot of time. The person has to plan them weeks or months in advance, and they cost a lot of money. So with these sorts of combination of these sorts of things, you know, some really important decisions are made. In the case of an athlete, you know, you'd have to think about when is the person ready to start doing more high impact activities? When are they ready to play, let's say, their sport again? And so what we're what we've been interested in is trying to develop a wearable knee brace or sleeve that has microphones and bioimpedance uh, and kinematics built into it to give structural and physiological information about the knee um, with these sensors. And then to be able to provide objective quantifiable information then to patients or, or athletes to be able to then make decisions based on what's going on with the knee. And so, you know, one of the things we're very interested in is knee acoustics and how the sounds emitted from the knee during movement relate to underlying, you know, frictional rubbing inside, how that may relate to uh, different joint injuries or arthritis state in patients. And so I'm going to try to play for you some of these sounds now from first the healthy knee and then one that has osteoarthritis. Hopefully you can hear these and uh, I'll start now. So that one is usually very quiet. So this is kind of a healthy knee sound. This is now going to be an age matched person that actually has osteoarthritis and uh, quite a bit of knee problems. And what you're hearing there is actually two cycles of the person extending and flexing the leg. And as they extend and flex the leg, the surfaces inside are grinding. With osteoarthritis, you have increased friction because the cartilage is worn down. And as the cartilage wears down, you get more kind of bone on bone rubbing. And you can kind of hear that from the sounds. So there, what you heard was actually uh, knee sounds from a person who had an ACL tear, anterior cruciate ligament tear. And in that case, you actually have laxity in the knee, you have some instability, and the sounds are a little bit more uh, uh, kind of unpredictable and have some sort of uh, greater randomness to them, but are very loud. So that's kind of what we've been founding. Uh, next slide is going to have some images of a cadaver limb. So if you're sort of uncomfortable with that, you may want to look away. Uh, but it's some important work that we did where we had to analyze for the first time in the same knee, if you induce an injury, how does that change the sounds that come from that knee? And of course, in a healthy subject, we can't go and create a knee injury. But in a cadaver, we can. So we used cadaver limbs. We opened them up, created a meniscus tear. We measured the sounds before and after and actually found that there was a big difference in the types of acoustic patterns we observed. Um, and this was an important finding for us because it helped us to understand how, uh, what types of sounds are associated more with acute injury versus what types of sounds are associated more with arthritis. We've done a lot of work also on the instrumentation side to build different knee braces. These were a couple of different braces that our group built. The one on the right is kind of a modular brace. The one on the left is a rigid brace that includes all these sensors inside of it. And one of the populations we've been very interested in studying is athletes. And so in this case, again, you have these KNN uh, graph plots, basically graphs showing the different points or the different sort of uh, windows of the actual knee sounds. And what you see is control subject on the left, where there's actually, it's a fairly homogenous cloud of uh, joint sound uh, data that can be observed there. Versus when you look at the subject with an injury, immediately uh, injured, but pre-surgery, you see actually a lot more of these different clouds of data. And really that captures the heterogeneity of the sounds that are occurring. When you look at the same injured subject after surgery, the cloud starts to regroup again and become more homogenous. And so what we found was in the control group compared to injured and acute before surgery, there's a big difference in this graph community factor 
which quantifies how many of these communities are required to describe this uh, graph representation of the data. But what we found was the sounds alone, while they're very interesting and scientific, and you know we have a lot more work to do there from a scientific standpoint specifically to better understand where they're coming from, how they relate to joint injuries, we noticed that actually the combination of sounds with bioimpedance was quite interesting. So bioimpedance is a modality that's used often in uh, bioinstrumentation cases to be able to assess tissue composition and especially fluid levels in tissue. And so what we've been doing is multi-frequency bioimpedance of the knee, especially in the context of movement. We've had to do a lot of work in terms of calibration to improve the capability by which these wearable sensing bioimpedance systems can be calibrated for use in different types of human tissues. Um, we've also done work to analyze the way that temperature changes of the skin affect the signal so that we can then compensate for some of that in some of our measurements. And we've done animal studies as well as computational modeling to determine what the resolution is that we can measure bioimpedance-based changes in fluid content in the joint. Uh, using both bioimpedance and acoustics, we were able to actually achieve a very high accuracy assessment of disease activity in adult patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So this was work where we collaborated with Hubert Lim and Eric Peterson from University of Minnesota. And what we found was the sounds from the knee were a good indicator of overall systemic inflammation for the person. In fact, the sounds alone could be used to pretty accurately estimate the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR, which is a blood biomarker that's used to assess inflammation for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The sounds combined with bioimpedance and angular measures were able to then be used to classify the disease activity that normally requires a 28 joint physical exam together with a blood biomarker of ESR to be able to assess. So what it means is that the wearable device together with the algorithms was able to assess disease activity almost as well as you know, a trained professional could for these patients. We wanted to then extend that work and understand how it would perform not only in adult patients with arthritis, but also in kids. Kids with arthritis actually is a really important population where both detecting the disease as early as possible and also getting them on the right treatment as early as possible makes a huge impact. If you have somebody who's seven years old and you wait three or four years or five years before getting them on the right treatment for their arthritis, they may have joint pain and even at the level of joint replacement required by the time they're 30 or 40 years old, could make a big impact on their life. So with Dr. Prahalad at Emory and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, we've performed a pretty extensive study in 116 subjects, including about 85 with juvenile arthritis and the rest healthy controls that are matched. We found that there's a big difference in the sounds uh, based on arthritis versus no arthritis. And even in active versus inactive knees, we're able to start seeing some differences that we're uh, trying to better quantify now. So some of this frictional uh, rubbing that occurs in the knee that changes the sounds, you know, while that was driven by systemic inflammation and specifically synovial thickening, we believe in the case of arthritis, that's not the only thing that can lead to changes in friction in the joint. So one of the main things that we wanted to better understand was if you start putting vertical forces on the joint and basically start compressing it, how does that impact the sounds? So basically, how does the loading status of the knee impact the sounds that are generated during movement? So we performed a study in, patient, in uh, healthy subjects performing vertical leg press activities, and they did vertical leg press at different weights, starting from 0% of body weight to 50% body weight and 100% body weight. And we quantified the changes in the signal and what frequencies those changes occurred in uh, for those different loading forces and found there were actually big differences. So that was an important finding for us. We wanted to also go further with this and say, what if we wanted to estimate the loading conditions of a tendon or a joint? And of course, to do this, you know, you can't really do that with passive measurements. So we were interested in active sensing as an approach for that. So we actually created a system where we had a vibration motor 
placed on the Achilles tendon and had the accelerometer measuring the vibrations further up the tendon. And I think of this as similar to if you play the guitar, where if you tighten the string and you hit it on one side, the vibrations will change. The frequency of vibrations will change and the way they transmit up the uh, architecture will actually change. So this is similar to what they do in mechanical engineering for modal analysis and these other sorts of other sorts of active sensing approaches. But here, what we found was at different levels of tension in the Achilles tendon, we were able to detect differences in the signal content in this sort of active sensing scheme. And that was pretty interesting. And this actually goes then a little bit beyond just health monitoring to more like biomechanics and human performance. You know, for the people who work on wearable exoskeletons, for example, a lot of times with an exoskeleton, you're trying to control joint impedance or the stiffness of the joint. So if you can measure the stiffness of the joint non-invasively, you may have a better control parameter that you would then set the control loop around for the exoskeleton. So I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities with that. Um, and headed in this sort of biomechanics and performance direction, we were very interested in bioimpedance specifically and how it might reflect how fatigued the person's muscles are and how much basically pain they may have after performing a hard workout several days later. So we performed a 14 day study or 13 day study where we had people performing exercise on a regular basis and they were doing some squatting exercises that were fatiguing. And at the same time, we were measuring gold standard indicators of fatigue status for the muscle with something called the dynamometer. And we were also taking their visual analog scale uh, reporting of their pain level. And what was interesting was we wanted to see on the first day when they performed the hard exercise, how well could they predict what their pain level would be two days later. And what you see on the left here is basically if any of you have uh, done hard exercise yourself, you probably already know this, but you can never really tell the day you perform the exercise how sore you're going to be two days later. It's very difficult to predict that. Uh, your body doesn't really allow you to do that sort of prediction very well. And that's what we found here. But what we also found was the level to which someone fatigued their, their muscles around their joint, as we measured through bioimpedance, actually was a very good predictor of how fatigued and how much pain they were in a couple days later. And so this is quite interesting from the human performance standpoint. If you're trying to train optimally, let's say, as an athlete for some kind of event, you want to understand how much you're pushing yourself and whether you should back off at certain times or increase training load. And so this kind of marker could be quite interesting. And in fact, the mechanism by which we were able to predict this pain level, we believe is due to the ability to accurately quantify fatigue at the joint. And so this was kind of the estimation, estimated reduction in muscle force with bioimpedance on the y-axis and the true reduction in muscle force on the x-axis. There was very good correlation between those. So this is kind of a sort of a, a look at a couple of different areas that our lab has worked in, one focused on cardiovascular, one focused on musculoskeletal, but I kind of want to bring it back and talk about what I think are some really exciting opportunities for the future. So I think with any of these sorts of technologies and really wearables in general, one of the exciting areas is really prevention. And so, you know, as we move from wearables that are more like gadgets that are kind of interesting consumer devices and fun to buy and play with, but really don't provide that much clinical or physiological utility, as we move from those to more medical grade wearables, and as we start deploying those medical grade wearables and prospective studies, I think we'll have fantastic opportunities to be able to build predictive models, maybe prevent, prevent people from sort of deteriorating, prevent chronic diseases from starting or at least delay their start, and maybe even prevent injuries uh, by giving people sort of this feedback ahead of time. Of course, these are kind of bold concepts, but maybe we can make some headway towards that direction. The second area I think that's really exciting is this concept of digital clinical trials. So I led the writing of this position paper that was uh, published in Nature Digital, uh, Nature Digital Medicine in uh, 2021. Uh, and this was an interesting paper where we talked about 
the importance of digital clinical trials, which basically normally you think of a clinical trial happening, let's say at a clinical site, but what if you could use digital technology with phones, sensors, surveys, even you know recruitment uh, and everything, basically interventions performed on a fully decentralized basis. Now imagine, you know, instead of just getting some cohort that happens to live close to the clinical trial site, now you can perform clinical trials over a highly diverse, maybe even international cohort that could better kind of allow you to test different technologies. In these sorts of studies, you need good digital biomarkers of how the person is doing that allow objective markers to be taken in these studies. And so I think a lot of the wearable technologies that are medical grade will be very exciting for that. The third area I think is really exciting is in mental health technologies. And I think we're already seeing a lot of work in this area, uh, but the ability to get deeper insight into the way that uh, different mental health conditions, stress, anxiety, uh, depression, you know, these sorts of things, how they impact the signals about a person's physiology that we can measure, and then tying those into maybe digital therapies could also be a really exciting area. And then finally, I think that uh, a lot of times people forget about pediatrics when they're building devices and thinking about technologies. And I really think that technologies that can impact the lives of kids should be a very high focus for people. And uh, I think there's a lot of exciting areas where we can make a big impact there as well. And so with that, you know, I'll thank, of course, the many people from my group that are doing amazing work. And I'm lucky to be actually with this group. And I'll take whatever questions people have. Hopefully I'm within the time window that's reasonable where we have time to have questions. Thank you so much, Omer. It was a great talk. Um, I'm very glad to know more about your research. I was familiar with your cardiovascular research. I honestly got to know that you also branched out towards a joint research, orthopedics, let's, let's say, just as a broad uh, level recently when you, when you let me have your uh, your abstract for this talk, and uh, I think it's very it's very interesting because I remember when I tore several years ago when I tore my right ACL. Oh, I could feel. Yeah, I, I was not. I was just a very amateur athlete. I, I know that you you did sports at quite high level, but anyway, I did also tear my H, my ACL, and I remember the sounds how they change. Uh, you know, day after day after you tore it, and uh, you know, with edema, then, you know, when edema gets kind of resolved, then as you rehab pre-surgery, you know, not being a pro athlete, I had to wait, as you said, several months before getting my surgery done. And then, you know, after surgery, I still have some sort of feeling that the sound that my repaired and fully functioning knee makes is not the physiological sound. So I related somehow to what you presented. It was really exciting. And uh, anyway, I I will open the floor, so to speak, our virtual floor to questions here in the chat box of Google Meet. I also received you. See, we have a multiple uh, multiple uh, technological platforms to 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 ask you questions. So I, I got a I got a question uh, through WhatsApp actually from a colleague of mine about the. Um, signal to noise ratio mm -hmm. how is how big of a potential issue it is i'm trying to to translate live okay so just just give me a second <laughs> oh, okay how does the uh signal to noise ratio interfere with the with both the detection and analysis of your signals of the signals that you detect with uh, with uh, your wearable technology if this is also an issue in general or how big of an issue is in general with wearable technologies uh and uh, uh related to this what's the role of uh, you know these ever growing technologies you know wi-fi bluetooth and so on and so forth for the optimization of uh, signal detection communication analysis in the future so these are the first two questions that i've got for you yeah excellent uh, excellent question i mean i think that the the signal to noise ratio is always a challenge i mean even even a lot of my PhD, actually, I wrestled with how to quantify signal to noise ratio and these sorts of signals, and it's hard. It's not like an ECG where it's straightforward, you know, 
And one of the one of the challenges is that these signals are very different person to person. So if you look at an ECG for 20 different people, it looks pretty similar. There are similar characteristics. If you look at a seismocardiogram for 20 people, there's going to be much more variability because the anatomy, the you know, the physiology, the mechanics, everything plays a role. So that said, I think that a lot of what we've done has been focused around exactly this issue. So the signal pipeline that I showed, you know, where we're trying to use techniques, not just for filtering the signal, but also for uh, quantifying signal quality on a way that's objective and automated, at least semi-automated, is really important because with that, then we can have markers for beats that are less trustworthy. And then we don't include those in the analysis. At the same time, we've done a lot of work on reducing vibration artifacts, motion artifacts in these signals with various, you know, signal processing and also deep learning architectures more recently. And I think there's room for more work in that area. Uh, these signals are mechanical measures. So if the person is moving mechanically, then the, you know, the, of course, the, the signals are going to be corrupted and needs to be dealt with. And the second question, I guess, around Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, I mean, I think that, um, I'm not sure about Bluetooth and Wi-Fi specifically, but I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the world of connectivity where, you know, if you have multiple sensors on a person, you have more of a sensor network kind of approach, maybe that can allow you to better uh, detect artifacts and reject them. And so having sort of connectivity and wireless connectivity among sensors could of course be very useful. Okay, thanks. I will proceed to translate these other questions that I got in the chat box. Uh, that's about the knee sounds. So the question that we get here is, um, so how about individual sounds from a single patients and groups of patients? So the, the, the person who's asking the question, uh, understands from your talk that there's a certain degree of variability between lesions, between injuries. Yeah. And also, of course, and this is this is true for almost any disease, right? Um, between individuals, uh, right. age, uh, even even, you know, with the same injury in the case of knee injury, for example, joint injury, you know, age, uh, how the injury, I mean, you mentioned also at the beginning of your of the second part of your talk, you know, even before talking about a joint injury, we can talk about trauma in general, right? And the cause for trauma can be quite different, right? Anyway, um, the 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 so what question a say a part of this question is what's the impact of variability yeah. uh, between injuries and within the same group of patients for other uh, sources of. Uh, variability such as age. Two, um, if you're able to generalize your technique, taking into account this variability, could you use uh, this type of technique and the, the data that you generate, the measurements that you generate with this technique to feed AI models that can lead to personalized care? Pretty much this translation of this question. Yeah, yeah. A great question. So, I mean, the the variability across individuals and uh, and even for an individual over time is very you know, is a very challenging aspect of this problem. So, for kids with juvenile arthritis, what we found is we can do uh, comparisons of one person versus the general population, and the main reason is that kids that do not have arthritis don't have much sound from the knees. The knees are very well lubricated at that age they haven't seen much wear and tear and if you take so if you take two seven-year-olds and one of them have arthritis actually you can pretty clearly see the difference in the sounds uh, so that's a case where actually we may have diagnostic capability but in older patients you know if you have somebody who's 70 years old and that person has you know osteoarthritis or not it may be very difficult actually to diagnose anything because there's so many other things going on with the knee so for those populations, we've been more interested in monitoring. So say, for example, you have somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis and you want to be able to tell when they're having a flare up. That would be a problem that would be very addressable because now you're looking at changes in that person's knee sounds or bioimpedance over time. They're their own control. 
you don't have to compare against the population. You're actually just comparing against the person themselves. So that's a good example of that. In terms of um, sort of fitting within AI models, I think that's exactly where we want to go with this. I mean, a lot of what we've been doing sort of in terms of the machine learning work has been to do regression or classification problems. But ultimately, you want these to be sort of fit within the workflow of clinical process and have an impact on the actual you know, clinical workflow of how they're dealing with these patients and treating them. Those are all sort of futuristic steps you know, that we can get to. But first, we have to understand what we're measuring and, and why that's important. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I don't want to take the opportunity away from anyone of asking question, but I don't see right now no question. So I have a question for you, actually. Oh, no, there's one more question from my colleague, Professor Chago. Chago, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor Omer. It's very interesting talk. I, I, I have a question about your, your, your studies about the heart failure, because I I would like to know because nowadays you know that this this systems that you use the IA and uh, the, and wearables you need some internet connection to send the data from a server to process and give back the the diagnosis something like that. But here in Brazil we have some remote uh, communities in the north part of Brazil. There is an endemic pro endemic problem with the Chagas disease. In the end, in the chronic stage of the Chagas disease, it leads to a heart uh, a heart failure of the patient. In, in this, in the many types of these communities, not to have the internet, not to have the in connection with the world. I would like to know if it's possible. Is your technology needed? Is most necessary to have some connection, internet, wireless, something like that? You, if you can, you can use this your technology in these cases the remote uh, communities in, in the world or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. No, excellent question. So I think what you're saying is that some of the patients with heart failure may not have connectivity and, and may not really be that technology savvy. And so their ability to use these technologies may be challenged. Is that kind of the question? OK, thank you yeah. so much. Is, Thanks is for your question. Is a question. Did I understand? Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, I think the last question is the end of a presentation. Uh, Chago, wait a second. Chago, Chago, wait a second. I think that Omer wanted just to make sure that yeah. what was the main issue. And I think, if I want to understand your question, the main issue is, uh, for example, for using remote areas where, you know, internet connectivity is a problem. Because, yeah. you know, this is something, Omer, as you can imagine, in a country like Brazil yeah. with a lot of remote communities is a major issue. So I think that that was not necessarily the the tech savvy part, rather the infrastructure. Got it. No, that totally makes sense. I think that's a really difficult problem. Uh, and I think that ultimately, I think if you could have a solution, so so in those sorts of communities, do they still have a uh, cell phone connection? Do they have smartphones and any sort of uh, connectivity in terms of their personal area networks or no? You know, some some of them they do. Some of them they do. I don't know the quality of the signal there. I don't right. know the bandwidth and this such. But you know, I, this storm desolation really is, is, is somewhere is really almost complete, but somewhere is not that bad. Right. And so I think that that you know that's kind of been our operating principle is that you know smart smartphones are so ubiquitous, right? And so if you have a smartphone network, you don't need to necessarily have Wi-Fi. You don't need to necessarily have, you know, a computer even. But if the person has a smartphone, they probably have the right level of connectivity where they could use our device. The other possibility is we can, you know, some of these uh, informations one day could actually be could actually be usable with, let's say, a closed loop control where the person actually receives information they need to receive from the device itself. We're not quite there yet, of course, you know, that's gonna take a lot longer, um, but, but yeah, that's a very good question. I think that's a very important question. Delivering in rural areas, that's a main challenge um, for any technologies. It could also be that in those areas, maybe you have to rely on community health workers, you know, maybe you have yeah. to rely on a better network of care as well. You know, it could be a totally different model. Right. So before wrapping up, uh, I have one last question 
and then we'll wrap it up. Um, okay, so what's the perspective? I'll try to summarize that, okay? Um, what's the perspective of using your technology for, uh, you know, per athlete monitoring, let's put it this way, okay? Not just uh, during training, but also, this is hard to imagine, but anyway, I will let you answer the question. During the performance itself, a marathon, uh, a game, uh, well, with a game, I don't know, it's hard. But, you know, I'm thinking, for example, that, you know, a lot of American football players, like offensive linemen, wear, always wear, almost always wear braces, knee braces. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. What, what's the perspective of uh, using it during, uh, you know, a game or a race and not just, you know, for training monitoring? Yeah, I mean, it would be huge. It's sort of top of the pyramid in some ways. You really have to establish that it's very valuable before somebody is going to wear it during an actual game, you know, or a competition. Yeah. In the case of the marathon, for example, you know, any any weight you put on that person is going to impact their performance, right? So it better be something that's really, really, really beneficial in some way. Um, so we're not sure about that yet. I mean, it's going to take a lot of work before we're anywhere near that. I think, though, um, in the training phase, actually, is where a lot of injuries happen. You know, of course, there's things that happen, traumatic injury when someone runs into you and that kind of thing. But a lot of the injuries that are maybe more preventable are ones that come from overtraining, maybe not stretching properly. You know, maybe you're putting weird loads on one muscle group that's not ready for it because of some other workout. So the, you know, optimizing training actually would make a big impact on athletes in terms of their injury risk and also their ability to maximize their performance. Yeah, and as a final comment, I'm thinking that maybe you would be able also to infer something on the type of load that is generated by a different surface. I mean, there has been a lot of talk about surfaces, right? Oh, yeah. uh, not that much in soccer, I would say, but in American football, I've seen it's 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 become so big this story of you know all the turf evolutions over yeah. the years, and you know in some cases. Players have been complaining recently about the risk for traumatic knee injuries. So anyway, Omer, thank you so much. I will stop my recording in a second. I would just ask you to wait for me for one more split seconds after I finish. But in the meantime, thank you so much again for your talk. It was really exciting. Thank you for being with us, of course, for your time. And I would also like to thank uh, the audience. So I will stop it here, and I will just wait for you for a second afterwards. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.